Dr. Antonio Harrison. What up, man? <laughs> you know, I, I've been uh, dying to do this interview, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your story. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah. It was uh, fun. The first question I wanted to ask is, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do for work, and so forth. Uh, born and raised Pasadena, California. Um, headed off to a four stoplight town in Iowa, Grinnell College. Kind of had a rough upbringing. And when people say in Los Angeles, the gang violence, crack cocaine, like that was a real thing. And it was a real thing, not only in my neighborhood, but in my household. You know, I saw that from a young age. And that's why I got the hell out of California. Ended up playing ball out there, but had a real bad knee injury that caused me to come home just for physical therapy. And after that, I didn't really know what to do, so I hit up one of my undergrad professors, the one I enjoyed the most, Dr. David Lopato. It's like, what do I do? Yeah. And he just said, you know, you always liked observing people's behavior and you should look at this thing called behavior analysis. And so I did, and it just made sense. Yeah. And that's when I realized that I was a behavior analyst before I was a behavior analyst. Mm -hmm. Because being young, I had to be in situations where I needed to know where the exit was, who was an unsavory character, who was help, who's the emergency outlet, and quickly pick up on people's nuances of their behavior to yeah. keep myself safe. Ever since then, I've been teaching grad school. I've coached high school football for 16 years as a varsity head coach and defensive coordinator. I work for a virtual reality fitness app called Supernatural. I do some consulting and work with clients one-on-one, -on -one. got a podcast, clothing line, challenge journal. I'm just yeah. I'm doing my thing. Yeah. yeah. You're using ABA outside of what we traditionally use it for, which is autism right, right. now. So, you know, I think um, you're an inspiration to a lot of people that want to be able to get a, a picture and a model of what you could do with ABA outside of the mainstream. Was there ever a time that you wanted to get out of ABA? Oh yeah, I wrote a letter that I posted on a blog I had at the time and in social media, and it was an open letter to behavior analysis. And I made it analogous to you know, you meet someone, you're hot and heavy and everything's so great. And then over time, yeah. you haven't really focused on this relationship or put the work into it. And that flame starts to dwindle. And it was my last ditch effort to see if I really still wanted to be in the field because yeah. I would show up places and one, no one looked like me. Yeah. Two, no one moved like me. And uh, there was nothing at conferences that was for me. Yeah. I was working with high school athletes, health, sports and fitness. Yeah, I could go to a special interest group meeting for five minutes, but I got to pay all this money to fly out, put up in a hotel, register for the conference and get CEUs for something that I, I didn't want to do. Yeah. That letter got a great response and it kind of relit that fire for me to just keep doing what I'm doing. Because yeah. at that point, it had been almost 10 years since I had published my study. Yeah. Wow. Is there anything that you would do outside of ABA? Say if ABA wasn't part of the picture? Ooh, I mean, that's the funny thing is, if everything that's happening, you can look at it and translate it into behavior analytic concepts and principles. Now, if I didn't know about behavior analysis, quite frankly, I probably would be right where I'm at now, just maybe not as good at it. Mm, yeah. That's just the truth. Part of the um, kind of the meat of this particular interview, um, have you had mentors that have supported you? Uh, outside of the field, it is one of my high school football coaches, Tom Fry, um, rest in peace, he passed away from a brain tumor. Um, he was, so my senior year, I was legit. Like I was all area, I was senior athlete of the year. But that entire year, my dad was locked up and missed mm -hmm. me balling. Fry took over as my dad. Yeah. I mean, he did things like made highlight tapes of all of my sports just so my dad could see it when he got out. Yeah. I remember, I think I was 16 right at the beginning of senior year and I ended up catching a DUI in possession. Who who came to pick me up out of jail at 2.30 in the morning? Yeah. Tom Fry. Yeah. You know, um, he was there and he just always, he let me know that I had great potential in me and he was always there and he never judged me. Yeah. Within the field, you know, it's hard because I, I want to say there's, I had a great cast of graduate school teachers and professors and department chair, but no one did what I did. Mm. So at the end of the day, people would help me the best they could, yeah. but no one, no one understood what I was doing on a football field. They understood the principles, yeah. but I'd have the same way they were trying to explain the principles to me. I was trying to explain to them what a three, a three technique is. We're defensive linemen. So it's a little bit harder to find mentors in behavior analysis, but have you had the opportunity to mentor? 
There's a few people that I provide supervision throughout, you know, their coursework and then who want to work with me later on. Mm -hmm. um, I've mentored a ton of kids as a high school football yeah. coach. I've never looked at it as mentorship. Mm -hmm. I just looked at it as I'm someone who's an authority figure in their life who has an impact. So I'm going to do right by them. Yeah. Right. The same way as put it this way. If, if you're an athlete of mine, you leave your kid with me. How many hours a week? 15. Mm -hmm. I get to take them on bus trips four hours away and come back like you're entrusting me with your child's life. So why wouldn't I treat them like they're my own? Yeah. I'm just like, man, I'm just making sure these kids know how great I think they are and um, when they're doing well and when they're not. Right. In your presentation earlier today, you you gave some stories of some of the achievements that some of your teams and players mm -hmm. have accomplished since the start of your coaching. So do you mind sharing some of those stories? Uh, sure. Um, I had one kid who uh, it was my first year at the second team I was at. He was a senior. He had never played in a league title game. And. He wasn't the best player, mm -hmm. uh, and he got burnt for a big touchdown in the beginning of the game, and he he thought I was going to yank him immediately. And I just came over and gave him some feedback about his positioning and what to do in response, kept him in the game, and he makes the winning interception to close it out. And he came over at the end crying, just going like, thank you for trusting me, right? I had a, a another kid who I'd make all of my football players sit in the front row of every single class during the season. I spot check it, right? Um, and later in, in his junior year at USC, he hit me up and just said, like, Coach, I have the best GP I've ever had in my life. And this kid was considered the class clown. And he's like, it's all because I still sit in the front row. I've had two kids reach out. Now, this was tough. Yeah. Tough in a good way. But two kids at a banquet, different teams, different years, in front of their own dad, talk to the audience and tell them how I was like a father figure for yeah. them, which is really like, you know, what do you say to that dad, yeah. right? But those dads all understood and respected because they worked so much. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the the best things I've ever done for a player, I had a kid come out of Kansas and he came out our way and he was meeting with different schools and he met with me and he wanted to come play for me. And he was good, really good. Yeah. Uh, he would have been playing college ball. He went to USC as a walk-on, but it was during the time they had turnover and Sarkeesian and all that, and like yeah. it was just a bad spot for him to be in. Yeah. Um, both his parents, D1 athletes, and I had to, going into his senior year, I called his parents, I was like, I want you to meet me at the park, not on mm -hmm. school grounds. I said, hey, your son's really good, and if he really wants to play at the next level, this ain't the place for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get him out of here. Yeah. He's not going to get seen. He's not going to get the looks he needs. He's not going to, I'll do everything in my power. But when it comes down to it, we just don't have a high enough level of competition for him yeah. to get the notoriety. Kudos to him though. He said, nope, I want to finish out here and, and do what I came to do. So, okay. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Where, where do you see the field of behavior analysis going? That's interesting. Cause I think the old guard is heading out the door. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's a new one coming in and there's a new crop of behavior analysts popping up that are all the younger generation who are not going to just be told what to do. Yeah. That's not, that's not their history. Right. I thought for a second, there was an interesting thing that was going on with act where that just kind of seemed, I thought it maybe was a fad, but then it seemed to become this real stronghold. Uh, then the whole DI movement kind of yeah. kicked up and then that was a thing for a while. So Quite honestly, I'm not really sure where the field is headed, but I have a feeling it's headed into other avenues outside of just autism, yeah. which I'm excited for. Um, I just hope that the folks who are in my position now, who like it's weird to think that now I'm becoming one of the old heads mm -hmm. and I'm here to help guide them in that, uh, that we stick around to help out to to not tell them what lane to take, but let them know like, hey, keep these things in mind and make sure you stay true to the science, but also true to yourself. Right. So I'm excited to see where it goes as it continues to grow. Um, and I'm just gonna keep doing my part. That's awesome. So, so you do a lot of sports, health and fitness. Is there anything that behavior analysts can learn from sports? Oh, so much. I'll take it to a few different levels. And anybody who wants this idea, take it. I've pitched it so many places, I'm done pitching it. Um, take the social skills 
classes and courses that you do and wrap them around sports teams for children with autism. Mm -hmm. You ask a parent who never thought their kid was going to have a friend, ride a bike, do anything on their own. You teach the kids some soccer skills. And at the end, with a group of people teaching them social skills as well, playing within a game, rules, instructions, uh, form and technique, uh, fine and gross motor skills. And then you have a little tournament at the end. And this parent who never thought their kid was going to do anything now just scored a soccer goal. Yeah. Game changing, yeah. man. I also think that we can learn a lot about who we are as leaders through sports. Yeah. It is a hard task to not only lead a group of young individuals or just athletes in general, but then you also have to lead your assistant coaches. And that's a whole True. different ball game. Yeah. The discipline, the work ethic, uh, being effective and efficient, um, finding ways to get the most out of people's performances, the most out of themselves, finding ways for people to, to push the, them, themselves without you having to be there. I mean, everything that happens in sports right. is already behavior analysis. They just have a different term for it. Right. That's it. Yeah. And that's most of the things that I see. I can easily translate those things into ABA right. terms. It's just that everyone else calls these things different. In my office, I have a sign that was made. It's, it says, reinforce like a champion today. Uh, because to me, it's so inspirational. The quote of play like a champion today, every single day play like a champion so to me it's reinforced like a champion every time you go in reinforce and so it, so it's something that i use those as metaphors to train and inspire our young professionals uh but i get it all through sports one of my favorite movies probably the favorite movie is rudy oh and i got to meet rudy in real life the real rudy really he came and talked to our high school team and told us this whole story that That's man awesome. you know he he would go to houses in, in Hollywood and knock on doors and hand scripts and he met a mailman and befriended him and that's how he got to the person who decided to direct the that's movie. Great. That, that's great. It's been such a pivotal movie in my, in yeah. my life, yeah. Well, and the cool thing too, and I'm, um, I'm overgeneralizing here, um, but I've learned two things about folks who are playing sports because they desire to, especially mm -hmm. youth sports. It's either because it's the easiest thing they have to do today because going back home is the hardest thing in their life. Yeah or their life's pretty easy and coming to my practice is the hardest thing they'll ever have to do. Yeah. So I'm either building character through that grit and grind or I'm building character by getting someone to realign with themselves before they go back home into chaos. Yeah, yeah. So. No, it's such a amazing environment to learn and to build character, like you said. Uh, the metaphor that's been in my life is when things feel tough. You know, we talk a lot about work-life balance, pick your ass back up yep. and you keep going, keep going, you know, and you reinforce like a champion yep. every single freaking day. So any words of wisdom uh, that you could give future behavior analysts? Uh, I said in the talk today, uh, that's be a person first before your behavior analyst, build those relationships with people and who they are, not just your, your colleagues, your supervisors, your, your employees underneath you, your clients, the people around you. Um, you never know the opportunities. My dad would always tell me, you play your ass off because you never know who's watching. Yeah. You never know who's watching. So be a person first. Um, the rest will fall into place. And the other thing is just know that what you're taught in school, that behavior is everywhere. Yeah. It's true. Right. We just haven't unfolded that yet by stepping outside of our lane. Yeah. Thank you for watching. For more insights on the power of mentorship, please watch our monthly Mentorship Espresso on the first Friday of every month. And if you like this content and appreciate it, please click like, subscribe, and share. Thank you.